So hi, we're here at the Linero Connect here at 2018 in Vancouver. So who are you? I'm Chris Benson. I did the uh, initial keynote to introduce neural network and AI technologies. So um, a lot of people are talking about AI. So a lot of things are happening right now. That's true. So what's going on? Well, it's, uh, it's a fantastic set of technologies that is maturing very, very rapidly. Uh, as has been noted in several of the, the speeches, we're, we're still in the very early days, um, but the, uh, the, it, it is just transforming what the world of computing is, is being able to do uh, at an exponential rate. And so literally month to month to month, uh, we're having these fantastic new changes coming out, and there's a lot of new things to learn all the time. So who's best at doing AI? Is it Google, Amazon, or Tesla, or <laughs> well, Nvidia? I, I, I don't. I know it's not me as being the best at doing that. I think there are uh, a lot of great companies doing a lot of great work, and I really, I don't really think of it as who's best. I really think of it as uh, probably who is serving their customers best with these technologies, and in, in, in terms of impacting their customers' lives. Because, for example, Google has a slogan. They used to say mobile first, now they say AI first. They are. That's true. I actually talked about that in my keynote. Um, <laughs> as they kind of, because from a popular standpoint, they kind of led the way and uh, you know were noticeable in the popular media for that initiative a couple of years ago. And so um, I think you know where, where they lead, many other companies uh, have followed. It's not just them uh, taking on a new buzzword. And, and using it at like to satisfy their investors, right, or something like that. It's they're actually really using it a lot. Oh, they're doing the amazing work. Um, yeah. I have a, a podcast called Practical AI, and I interview people. I've interviewed Google Brain people and uh, and from other teams and stuff. And the work that they have been doing is just amazing. One of the just it, it is is a, a very small project they did. It was kind of an on the side thing almost. Um, they were contributing to uh, astronomy and classification of new planets uh, in the universe that they were able to. Uh, detect and because they were able to process the information uh, much much better than humans had pr uh, before that or other machine learning algorithms so there, there are just so many use cases that Google and many other companies out there are, are utilizing these technology, technologies and they're, doing, for. they're doing something good with cancer research uh, yeah their uh, deep mind uh, has has been doing cancer diagnosis uh, over the last couple of years I believe um, um, but there are uh, that's that's one of many many of the applications in healthcare that that are being applied. And neural networks are going to be so embedded in healthcare going forward, to where you will you will not have healthcare without the technologies in the years ahead. So uh, so it's really working. It's not just uh, some little uh, uh, what's it called uh, projects on the side and stuff oh, no. like that. Oh no! Oh no! I mean, uh, there are. Uh, many, many billions of dollars being invested in these technologies. Um, something that I didn't mention in my own keynote, but uh, the U.S. Department of Defense just allocated uh, $2 billion for AI research. Um, and that's just one budget. That's one budget of many. Um, and so, and if you look at the, you know, some of these top companies such as Google, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft that are working in this space, uh, they have gigantic budgets uh, for, for AI initiatives. And they expect results. They're not going to allocate uh, such, uh, such amounts of money unless they're expecting to get a return uh, on their investment on that. And that's, and you know, we've only talked about American companies, uh, or at least companies that originated in America there, the, the Chinese government uh, is investing uh, many billions of dollars uh, into AI research. Uh, the Russians are, uh, is, I've talked to Israeli AI companies, lots of companies in Europe. Um, it's, it's, a global, it's a global movement at this point in terms of driving value to the customers through AI. What is Microsoft doing, for example? In AI. Well, I, you probably have to ask them for detail because I, I don't work for them. Um, I have, uh, uh, they're doing some pretty amazing things with their framework and there are certain use cases that each of the frameworks are stronger in, but I'm going to defer the question to somebody who would know better than me. And, and Amazon is doing all their, uh, uh, they're depriving a lot of the internet. Sure. Like I all mean, these websites are using, and they have some AI kind of a. Uh, 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 that's a great point. So all of so whether you're talking about uh, Amazon, AWS, or whether you're talking about Google, uh, Google Cloud Platform or uh, Azure by Microsoft, all the cloud platforms are uh, providing different services around AI uh, technologies now uh, at different levels um, to where uh, anywhere from um, renting GPUs just by themselves and you have to do all the work yourself to, uh, to specific services that give you a full offering as a data scientist or engineer to be able to go do your work entirely on their platform with all the tooling. So you can kind of buy into that at whatever level that you want. And uh, 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 
did you on your podcast did you talk about the Elon Musk how scared he is of AI? Well, we do actually talk. Uh, we actually, I have mentioned Elon Musk specifically. Um, we do talk quite a bit about different perspectives. Um, I think uh, uh, AI is is a technology that's a little bit unlike others, and that uh, in the years and decades and even centuries ahead, uh, we have some careful steering to do on where we want to go. Um, and you have people uh, like Elon Musk being uh, probably the most notable that is uh, very worried about the downsides. Uh, and you also have uh, a lot of advocates talking about the upsides. Um, I tend to, to stay in the middle and give both sides equal time. Is it possible, I mean, my little kind of like understanding of the Elon Musk angle is that maybe he doesn't really like Google and he's, he's warning people not to let them have too much power in this field maybe, so, or something so, like that. So, I, you know, full disclosure, I don't know Elon Musk. I've never talked to him. Uh, I've just read and, uh, you know, get his tweets and such like everybody else. I believe that he's very genuine in what he's trying to say. Um, and I think that there is uh, merit in being careful with AI going forward um, because as with any new technology uh, that is powerful enough, there can be great upsides and terrible downsides. And um, my position is probably we will do amazing things with AI in the years and decades ahead, and we will probably make some awfully big mistakes also um, and have to deal with that, just as we have with other technologies. So um, my advice in that realm is uh, you don't necessarily need to take sides of it's good or it's bad. I would just say we all need to be thoughtful and careful on behalf of our children and grandchildren that we make good decisions today usually humans are pretty good at just being careful a little bit you know and but doing amazing things but still being careful right well I hope so it's uh, we're dealing with the technology that uh, is in today as we as we record this in 2018 it can be very good at solving very specific complex problems but they're fairly narrow in scope um, in the years ahead, as new uh, technological advancements that we don't know what they are uh, evolve, it may be that it doesn't, uh, it's not so narrow, or we may be able to combine many, many narrow models together to do more generalized uh, problem solving. And, and therefore, um, we need to be cognizant of how that will evolve over time and be smart about how we approach it. And another thing Elon Musk is doing is the open AI. Is that a good thing? Is that working uh, out? I think so. So, and uh, I've interviewed uh, some, we've, uh, well, actually my, my podcast co-host has interviewed uh, an open AI person. Uh, I think that that is one of a number of organizations where that conversation across organizations is fantastic. And we need more of that. Um, we need both the engineering, the, the data science side, and as we've been talking about here a bit, the ethical side uh, needs to all be part of that same conversation. And we need to have uh, all those voices voices part of it. I think that the engineering, uh, the business, and the ethical all need to roll into one to make a good decision going forward. And actually, uh, uh, a little bit more about Tesla and Elon Musk is, uh, you know, they ship all these cars with the promise that eventually they'll be able to activate self-driving mode. So okay. hopefully they'll figure it out, right? Uh, it's, this is another kind of AI that's kind of has to run locally on the car and kind of work out just based on the cameras. Sure, and, and, and Tesla is one. Uh, NVIDIA also is doing the same stuff as is Google, um, as is uh, a, a number of others at this point. It's a, it's a fairly, uh, uh, it's a space that's expanding rapidly. Uh, my personal belief is that we will have some challenges um, going ahead, but I also believe that those companies will get that right. Uh, I think it is highly probable in the years ahead that autonomous driving will be orders of magnitude safer than having humans uh, that are not communicating among themselves making their own decisions uh, as they go forward. So I think, I think though we will have some bumps in the road to get there, I think autonomous driving will make transportation many orders of magnitude safer than it currently is. It, it sounds like Google is saying that they already are safer than humans, right? I think statistically they are, um, and I think I think that all of the uh, all of the companies that are in this space have established that. But uh, you know, all it takes is one terrible accident um, where one person dies, and that is uh, a, a, a deep tragedy. So uh, I, w I want I want to note that there's the humanity of recognizing that when you make a mistake, it can cost lives, and that's that is horrendous. Um, if you're looking at it. As a mathematician, though, from a statistics standpoint, 
then, then yes, the, then if you look at the number of people who die on a given day, uh, like here in the United States, and compare that to the number of deaths from autonomous vehicles, statistically, it's already a much safer thing. And I think that's only going to increase over time. So, For example, Uber had one accident. They kind of canceled the whole program. Yeah, and I think that's that's one of the challenges. Um, I, I, the, the, the lady who died in that, um, you know, that she was jaywalking, right? I, I'm not enough. Something like that. Maybe, yeah, I'm not maybe. familiar enough with those circumstances. But that, I mean, that is truly a tragedy, as is every death. Um, and um, and and you know, independently, actually, when I'm not talking about AI, I'm talking about uh, you know, rescue and, and animals. And so I'm very conscious about uh, trying to save lives. That's a big part of my life. Uh, and so we really need to recognize the tragedies when they occur. Work in every way possible to try to prevent this from happening, but I actually think that this technology will contribute to life-saving in a much greater form than it would uh, cause death. So I, I actually, I'm, I'm a big fan of autonomous vehicles, but I think we will have a, a tragedy here and there on the way, but probably far fewer than if you just go out on the street of a city on any given day and the number of traffic accidents we have. Maybe the lesson that could be learned from that is, uh, you know, this whole lawsuit that was going on between Google and Uber? about their self-driving technology. Yeah. Maybe it's because Google didn't want to share their awesome, maybe higher quality self-driving technology to Uber. That's maybe the reason that this accident happened. Because possibly the Google AI would not have uh, had this issue, maybe. So I, I'm not going to get in and litigate that. I'm not familiar with that particular issue there. Um, I'm going to recognize that it's unlikely for any particular for-profit corporation to share proprietary technology uh, across. But having said that, we do have a common ethical concern across organizations to make sure that these technologies uh, don't cause harm. It, it, much like uh, doctors start with that do no harm uh, saying, I think think that we really need to do that with autonomous vehicles. But I would be very, very surprised um, if uh, proprietary technologies were shared across companies. But this is what happened in the keynote after your keynote, right? Mm -hmm. So ARM is talking about they want to share a whole bunch of software, sure. source code for their neural network system. Yeah, I think, and I think there are places, this is very typical when you are doing standards uh, work. And that is that um, the communication between different functions and how that workflow works, it, uh, there, there is an incentive to, so that um, you make it less painful on your customers who are using your platform to be able to have common way so they can only, uh, they're only required to learn one way of, of making those workflows work. But having said that, the workflows are working between components and I would fully expect those components to have proprietary vendor specific stuff in it, but they're basically abstracting that away through these standards bodies. So um, I do think standards in, in what Linaro has, I, and I can speak myself as a practitioner in the field, what Linaro has announced today, I think is fantastic. I really wish they had announced this, you know, it had been able to two years ago because it would have saved me and my team so much pain. Uh, um, in what kind of ways? Because uh, as, you, as you want to move out onto the edge, it, you, you can find some, uh, it's not as hard to standardize if you are in a centralized cloud environment or something like that. Um, you can apply whatever framework you want and whatever platform. But it, but historically, up until now, as you've mo moved out onto the edge um, and you have different vendors with different devices, uh, different ARM processors that have different, uh, where acceleration is being implemented in different ways and it has different support for different frameworks. You notice I keep saying the word different and that means that you get out onto the edge and there's so many choices. And for um, a business that's trying to get these technologies out onto the edge, they quickly get penned in with a particular vendor's approach. And if they're going to expand across multiple channels, then they are gonna have to learn a particular deployment approach for every one of those. And that's the pain I've experienced myself. I think what Lenaro is saying with this announcement going forward is, why don't we all agree as an industry to push outward in a unified way and, and, and have that support be unified? And there's still plenty of room for proprietary uh, competitiveness within that without uh, making the customer's life difficult. And that's what I definitely applaud with what they've announced today. Because maybe a little bit what the companies like Google, for example, are thinking is that if they have their best AI, they might be controlling the, the future. Like if this becomes a big deal, everybody needs to use it. Then suddenly, is this the key to kind of like become the next hundred trillion dollar company or something? Uh, potentially, I I don't see it as is one party uh, or even just a few because there's so. I think what's different now in the AI industry versus ten years ago now 
is 10 years ago, there were only a handful of players in the space. Um, and, and, and that was Google and Amazon in earlier days as they were kind of moving into this. And that uh, 10 years might even be too far to say that. But what's happening now is there's so much um, business value that's being sought from these technologies and so much investment to achieve that from different organizations that you don't just have you don't just have a handful or even dozens or even hundreds you have thousands of companies with substantial investment in AI at this point and that is only going to grow so um, I think what you're going to find is different layers of capability um, and different amounts of scope if you're if you're a Google or Amazon or Microsoft um, you're able to handle many, many different use cases. Um, if you're a smaller company, you may be just tackling one or two or three use cases, but there's many more of you that are out there doing that. So uh, it's, a, it's an industry that is growing exponentially right now. So do they have to standardize and collaborate on the algorithms or on the protocols or some? Well, they already kind of they already are. There, there's there's the concept of transfer learning where you have um, <coughs> what, what are essentially libraries of algorithms or models that are available out there, model architectures that are available out there that you can utilize. And so you are you can already go out with TensorFlow, and there there are a number of different TensorFlow examples for different use cases. And so rather than me having to sit down and start from scratch, I can take somebody else's uh, architecture and then say, and then try it on my model. I may not get results that I want and say, well, how can I, how can I move this architecturally toward what I need? And that's where probably most of the work will be in the years ahead. Not everybody is a research scientist in AI. That, that's a fairly select group. I think 99% plus of the people that are working in this industry are going to be the engineers or what you might call a data developer who is taking, going, you, picking a framework and taking the different types of examples available within that framework and through the, through the wonder of transfer learning, being able to pull that in and then tweak it into what they need, make the adjustments they need to get productive quickly. So, so what's next with your podcast or with the, what are you doing in the, uh, what, what are you planning to do? There's just so much uh, that's going to come, you, you don't need to plan it out? It's just coming? <laughs> I, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. The world is moving so fast right now. Um, a big part of my life is, is coming to, uh, to organizations like Lenaro and this Lenaro Connect uh, conference and talking to people about these technologies, just like what we're doing right now. Um, I, and through the podcast, uh, we'd like to bring in luminaries in the AI space, uh, whether they be on the business side or the technical side, as well as just practitioners that are out there actually doing cool work, um, but that nobody may know of, of them. And, and we like to highlight those and give people the taste of how you make AI practical uh, and accessible for anybody out there. So how many episodes have you had so far in the podcast? Uh, we're fairly new. We've had, I think there are 13 that have been released and we always are working on several episodes uh, in the funnel. So what so. kind of examples do you have in those 13 episodes? Pretty much everything. We are, uh, we have a series of, um, of what I'll just refer to as senior executives at uh, some of these key AI companies um, that are going to be coming on in the days ahead. Uh, we've actually had some um, uh, in the weeds uh, technologists that are implementing some really, really cool stuff come on and explain how they did it. So if you are, for instance, a small business owner and you say, hey, um, I've, I'm willing to invest in um, some computing power in my cloud of choice, and I'm going to pick one of the frameworks, you know, maybe TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, whatever you want to do, um, and I'm going to get in and do it. Our podcast tries to make it uh, a real engineering thing instead of a pie in the sky um, uh, initiative. And so if you were that person who wants to get in and understand what the realities are, both the good and the bad, the constraints and everything, that's the audience that our podcast is trying to address. And you